uh, they, you know, I don't know, my, my particular formidable years of, of forming my taste and being, uh, cr- you know, crazy about and, and passionate about, you know, acquiring music and record shopping and record digging when, when that started and was just a burning thing in my life was probably age 16 and, and until now or until, you know, 22 or so, 23 first phase of it that age group now uh is not, it just feels like they're not they're not really it's not one of those bands that is universally regarded as a you know a credible and okay to like influence um such as say jesus mary chain would be yeah uh because in a way you know it takes it takes some weird Thing to happen, I think, like Sofia Coppola using a song in a movie, if you will, yeah, um, to 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 jumpstart things like that, like say with Mary Chain, um, and you know, yeah, and that age group is aware of bands like My Bloody Valentine and and Dinosaur Junior, you know, bands that were heavily influenced by Who's Could Do. So I don't know. That's that's a confusing kind of. Thing and I could get very convoluted if you let me, so I want to do that. <laughs> no. The thing was um, when I, I listened when I my first taste of Husker Du was you know I I I and I, I kept basically kind of came of age in the early '90s you know with the, the vibes right. with Nirvana and things like that. But once I listened to the groups like Nirvana and, and the Mud Honeys of the world and the Pixies, it made me want to go back and, and, and give a try out to Husker Du. In fact, I liked Husker Du so much the first time I heard it. It was right around the time that Sugar was coming into play. Bob's okay. Bob's post uh, Husker Du outfit, and, uh, you know, when he, his post group. But, you know, hearing for the first time, you know, like the song Could You Be The One was kind of the first song I really got a taste of uh, from Warehouse. It was on their, you know, what, their main, their major label years. But the the thing that really drew me in was the guitar. I mean, that was a right. very distinctive guitar style that, 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 that Bob Mould, uh, you know, put into the masses' ears. I mean, it was it was very cool. And, and it led me back into the earlier years of the group. When it was more of a punk influence, you know, you can basically, yeah. you know, the first few albums were very straight ahead punk rock, and as that band yeah. moved on, they really molded into something good. They became two, you know, tunesmiths of their own design. Right. Um, well, we could go with a few things here. Uh, the well, you and I are about the same age this time. Yeah, so I'm 34. It, uh, yeah, thereabouts. Um, and it. I don't know. It's it's weird how they're. I I wanted to do that too when I would get into bands that were you know topical at the time. I wanted to go backwards. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. It, I don't. Uh, I can't really state that whether that's a, that's a, a huge you know impulse these days with with younger people. But I will say that if we want to just completely abruptly shift into something else, if we want to talk about the guitar tone. Mm-hmm. Um, Yes, that is something that I wrote uh, kind of extensively about for the book, and we kind of had to edit out for some of that for space reasons. Yeah, uh, I'm very interested in in you know how he how he did that, and it's it is influential. However, you don't hear so much subsequent bands being able to pull it off. It's the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's there's attempts at it, but like like say Sonic Youth, you know Sonic Youth obviously very distinct guitar tone. You do hear bands pulling that off because it has to do with the tuning. Um, Bob's distinctive tone, if I may wager a guess in a way, uh, or just going from you know my research, was more to do with uh, the equipment and the way he played. Um, he there's a lot of solid state equipment, and he played an Ibanez, Ibanez Rocket Roll too, which was Ibanez's. Um, they, that was their Gibson, Gibson co- you know Gibson copy of the Flying V, mm-hmm. um, and it was uh, I think his guitar was around a 74, 75, 76 model, something like that. Uh, and he played um, 
played with a he played very uh, very he played with light strings. I think it's heavy no heavy strings light pick. I think maybe if I'm not wrong. Um, and he just got a very thick. I don't, there really wasn't anything before that. You know, nobody did that before Bob did. Mm-hmm. The, the the whole there's you know there, there was loud and then there was really loud. And the really loud was brought about by Husker Du, like in a live setting. Uh, and, you know, there was no space in between the songs. The guitar was allowed to, you know, he had a, he had a, he had a chorus pedal or he had some, you know, some things that were, that would, that would really swirl, kind of swirl the sound around and have it feed back in between the songs. So, that, that, you know, there was never silence live. Which is interesting. Obviously, a huge influence on the Pixies, who would that, they would also do their live sets the same way uh, later. Um, anyway, I, so it's it's something that uh, I think he really hasn't gotten a lot of credit for. I only found a couple of instances where he's actually interviewed by you know Guitar Magazine. Um, I think Sugar had a big you know that that was also a, a big deal. In, in guitar circles, mm-hmm. um, but the, the Husker sound was the high end kind of trebly, but also uh, I don't know. I, I'm not a, I'm not a gearhead, so I can't really talk very very fluently about mm-hmm. about uh, about you know gear with like guitar gear. So without you know making a fool of myself uh, in a way, but um, yeah, no, I, it's something that. Uh, I never thought he really got enough credit for, especially with the, you know, when the band didn't always have that. He didn't always have that tone in the band. It kind of came into its own around the third record, Metal Circus. Uh, you can hear it on the record before that, but it wasn't uh, universally, you know, all over. Everything falls apart. Um, you know, and then it really, really was obvious and distinctive on Zen Arcade. So, you know, it wasn't, although Bob did have a lot of, uh, a lot of that was in place from the start, and he knew what he wanted from the start. So it was just a matter of, you know, those guys didn't have a lot of money, and uh, they really had to eat some crow, if you, if you will, for, for years and years before they could afford, you know, their gear and whatnot. Well, yeah, and, 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 but the thing is, too, around here, you know, being up in the, the state of Minnesota, I mean, they basically helped kickstart a, a true scene in, in oh, that sure. in Minneapolis St. Sure. Paul area that started up in the late '70s, moved into sure. into the '80s because it was, you know, some people look at the '80s, it wasn't just all Prince and, and, and the time and all this stuff. There right. was a great burgoing, uh, you know, scene of independent rock, you know, with the replacements too, you know, and, and with Soul Asylum. I mean, those three, when, that's when you think, when people mention that area and that time, those are the three that come up instantly. And I think right. out of the three, I, I think that they, I, I, Husker Du, for me, always was one that just had more of that punk edge to it. I mean, replacements were good, but they sort of got soft. Their edges sort of gotten, you know, they, they yeah. weren't as sharp. as the, I mean, With every album, they kind of got a little softer, more melodic. But Husker Du, they always seem to retain still a little bit of that bite. Sure. Uh, yeah, a couple of points there. Um, as far as uh, Minneapolis scene goes, uh, some credit should certainly be given to uh, the Suicide Commandos, and specifically their guitarist, Chris Osgood, who uh, um, was uh, Bob's guitar teacher for a short time uh, in 79 or so. And uh, the Suicide Commandos were, you know, the Minneapolis's, well, one of the country's first actual punk rock bands uh, very early on. Um, they were kind of part of that. Well, they tried to be a part of the, you know, the way the Ramones and Perubu wave of, of bands where the majors were paying attention to punk rock and whatnot. And they were signed to Polygram, I want to say. Polygram. I don't want to, I'm probably going to get that wrong and, and I should know that. But uh, <clears throat> they had one record on a major and it kind of uh, it didn't go anywhere. But, you know, and then Chris was one of the three people that started. Uh, Twin Tone Records, and then, you know, he he moved out so Peter Jesperson could come in, and then, you know, so Chris could concentrate on the band, but yeah, he he uh, gave Bob guitar lessons, and, you know, Bob and Grant and Greg were all very aware of 